January. If you're a January baby, your body got forged in the cold before you ever saw a snowflake. Being built in the darkest stretch of the year, your biology had to adapt. Late pregnancy low sunlight means your body had to rely more on melatonin and brown fat, the heat-making tissue that helps you stay warm and burn energy more efficiently. That's the hidden advantage of being born in January. Better cold tolerance, a slightly more efficient baseline metabolism, and a naturally leaner build. Winterborn babies also tend to have metabolic traits that make fasting or longer gaps between meals easier to handle. And, research suggests that folks born in winter score a bit higher on novelty-seeking, meaning you may be the one volunteering for the cold plunge while others balk. But winter biology comes with a trade-off. Low maternal vitamin D in the last trimester, simply because there's so little sunlight, is linked to slightly higher risks of preterm birth and lower birth weight. And in adulthood, those who are born in winter are at a slightly higher risk for higher blood pressure, schizophrenia, and multiple sclerosis. Nothing dramatic, just the kind of winter timing effect most people never hear about. February. If January was about cold, February is about germs. If you were born this month, you arrived right in the middle of peak virus season. That early exposure means you were more likely to catch colds and respiratory bugs in your first year. But the upside is that this same early hit pushed your immune system to mature more quickly and grow stronger than most. You also tend to run more efficient fevers, ones that reach effective temperatures and clear infections faster. Your birth timing influences possible allergies as well. Winterborn babies, including February, are more likely to have reactions to early life foods like cow's milk or eggs, while babies born in warmer months tend to develop pollen-related sensitivities instead a pattern mostly based on what you were exposed to early on. There's another downside worth noting. Like others born in colder months, February babies show a slightly higher risk of childhood asthma, along with an increased risk of type 1 diabetes, which researchers believe is linked to the same early viral exposures that help toughen your immune system to begin with. On a lighter note, February is the least common birth month of the year, even though conception rates spike around the 14th. And if you were born on the 29th, you have one of the rarest birthdays on the planet. Oddly enough, small studies suggest that leap day babies have slightly longer lifespans, possibly because only the toughest ones make the cut. March. March babies get something the winter months don't. Sunlight creeping back in just as the last stretch of development happens. That rise in daylight means your mom's vitamin D levels were climbing during the third trimester and that boost tends to show up in real physical differences. March babies generally arrive a little heavier, with better bone mineralization and slightly better lung development, all linked to that late pregnancy vitamin D. There's another advantage that doesn't get talked about much. Babies due in early spring often stay in the womb a bit longer than those gestating through the darkest months. It's just a little more time for growth, which fits with the higher birth weight seen in March. The advantages don't stop in infancy. March babies have lower risks of autoimmune diseases, lower average blood pressure, and lower rates of obesity later in life, possibly because vitamin D plays a role in how the body handles fat and energy. Studies have also found that adults born in March score a bit higher on IQ tests and show a reduced risk of ADHD, which researchers think may come from more stable maternal hormones during late winter and early spring. If there's any minor downside, it's the same one seen across all winter births, a slightly higher chance of childhood asthma. But overall, a March birthday puts you right at the turning point of the year, winter fading, light returning, and a biology that reflects the first benefits of spring. April. April hits a kind of just right window for development. Your mom finished pregnancy in mild weather, steady temperatures, and decent sunlight, not freezing, not sweltering, which keeps late pregnancy stress low. When the environment is calmer, your physiology tends to be calmer too. Across multiple populations, April babies tend to have some of the most optimal birth weights and their lungs tend to develop well. When vitamin D levels are decent and late pregnancy infections are lower, the data show lower rates of childhood wheeze and asthma in some groups. There's another advantage tied to this time of the year. Babies conceived in midsummer and born in early spring are more likely to grow taller as adults and hit puberty a bit later. 
Adults born in April also show higher stress resistance and are a bit more likely to finish higher levels of education, patterns which researchers link to more optimal development in the womb. The only real trade-off is being born right before peak pollen season means that once you're a toddler, you're more likely to struggle with seasonal allergies. Not because of pregnancy conditions, but because your first big exposure happens right in the middle of the allergen spike. Still, an April birthday means you got the closest thing Mother Nature offers to ideal conditions, even if your sinuses file a complaint later on. May. If you were born in May, congratulations. You happen to land in one of the healthiest months of the year. Your gestation ran through winter into early spring, but you showed up right before the real heat and heavy grass pollen season kicked in, an ideal setup for development. By the time your mom reached her final trimester, sunlight was consistent, her vitamin D levels were improving, and far less viruses were floating around. With fewer infections and more stable physiology, your last stretch of development took place under better conditions than most babies born in winter. Thanks to that, May babies tend to start out with solid birth weights, strong early lung function, and healthier overall development during those first months of life. And the advantages don't stop there. Large-scale studies have found that May births show the lowest overall lifetime disease risk of any month, fewer hospital visits for chronic conditions, and a 10 to 15% lower risk of heart disease, likely tied to efficient cardiovascular development during that well-timed last trimester. The only mild drawback happened during pregnancy, not at birth. Most of your mom's pregnancy overlapped winter, meaning she was battling cold and flu season while being told she could take nothing stronger than Tylenol. She risked getting sick so you didn't have to. And honestly, you kind of owe her for that. June. June gives you something no other month really can. Maximum daylight right as you enter the world, which helps your internal clock lock onto a strong day-night rhythm and sets you up for steadier, more predictable sleep-wake patterns in infancy. All that light affects mood, too. Compared with winter births, June babies are less likely to deal with seasonal affective problems or depression later on. Like May babies, those born in June are also more likely to weigh more at birth, have stronger bones, and go through puberty later. At least part of that comes from avoiding the worst seasonal infections during infancy and plenty of daylight to support healthy growth. There also seems to be an edge for June babies in certain sports. Some studies find that people born in early summer perform slightly better in precision-based activities like tennis and golf. The one real downside? June babies have a higher chance of myopia, or nearsightedness. The reasons aren't fully understood, but researchers think it may be tied to how early life light exposure affects eye growth. Altogether, a June birthday means you started life with the longest days of the year on your side, helping shape strong circadian rhythms, healthy growth, and a naturally brighter mood, even if you might not see those sunny days as clearly as everyone else. July. Being born in July means your body learned how to handle summer heat before you even learned how to roll over. When pregnancy ends in sustained periods of heat, the maternal cardiovascular system works harder to keep both mom and baby cool. Combined with the newborn period in the warmest stretch of the year, that timing pushes your own cardiovascular and temperature control systems to mature a bit faster. Which is why July babies tend to tolerate warm weather better than those born in colder months. Later in life, that heat tolerance comes in handy. Research has found that July babies have an athletic edge in endurance and outdoor sports, like distance running, cycling, and soccer. The kinds of activities where staying comfortable in the heat actually matters. July births also show slightly higher testosterone levels in adolescents, which some researchers think may contribute to advantages in certain sports. And just like June, July babies tend to land in a healthier birth weight range. There's also a small link between midsummer births and higher adolescent activity levels, likely because people who handle heat well are more likely to spend time outside. But there's always a few trade-offs. While people born in July tend to have lower rates of multiple sclerosis, they have a higher risk of skin cancer, especially if they're fair-skinned. They are also more prone to certain food allergies, especially to summer fruits and vegetables such as peaches, melons, and berries. Just one more catch. July newborns are more vulnerable to dehydration and heat stress in those first fragile weeks. But once they're past that window, they sit back and enjoy the weather, while everyone else complains about sweating their balls off. August. 
If you showed up in August, sunlight was still baked into your biology. Your final stretch of development happened during peak summer, when your mom's vitamin D levels were at their highest of the entire year. Like other summer months, August babies tend to come in a bit heavier, have stronger bones, hit puberty later, and grow into slightly taller adults. Summer timing seems to leave a mark on temperament, too. People born in August show slightly lower rates of depression and bipolar disorder, and tend to be more optimistic and extroverted than folks born in the winter. Some studies even say August babies are more likely to identify as morning people, probably thanks to all that third trimester daylight seeping in. Socially, August is the most common birth month in places like the U.S., which means more kids your age growing up around you, and birthday parties with a built-in crowd. But there's one part of August no one escapes, the school cutoff. In most places, September 1st decides the grade line, which makes August babies the youngest in the classroom. That age gap, sometimes almost a full year, shows up in early test scores, special education referrals, and ADHD diagnoses that are really just younger kids being compared to their older peers. It levels out later, but the early disadvantage is real. September. Showing up in September gives you a head start that many people never realize they had. Thanks to the classic September 1st school cutoff, you're often the oldest kid in the room. That extra maturity doesn't just show up in height or coordination, it shapes performance. Research consistently finds that September-born kids score higher on early academic tests, are far less likely to need special education, and even earn more money in adulthood. All because that early age gap gives you a running start. Being at the tail end of summer, vitamin D levels still have a strong effect, and just like other summer months, people born in September tend to have slightly taller stature and lower risks of multiple sclerosis and schizophrenia. Studies have even found that September babies are more likely to live past 100, a pattern researchers connect to healthier third trimester gestational environments. There's also an advantage for September kids in sports leagues that use fall cutoffs. Being the oldest in your age group often means more playing time, more confidence early on, and better odds of being pushed into advanced teams when those differences matter the most. As for downsides, they're pretty limited. The main one is that early fall births overlap with heavy seasonal allergens, so September babies have a slightly higher chance of pollen sensitivities during early childhood. But that's about all. October. October babies are built differently stronger and healthier than most. Studies consistently show higher bone density, lower overall cancer risk, and about a 10% lower chance of cardiovascular disease later in life. It's one of those birth month patterns researchers keep finding across population after population. There's also a mental health advantage that rarely gets mentioned. People born in October show some of the lowest rates of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and suicide rates are about 17% lower compared with annual averages. That combination puts October near the top in longevity research, right next to September. Performance-wise, October birthdays pop up in unexpected places. Kids born this month tend to do well in power and coordination tests, grip strength, vertical jumps, sprint starts, and they're disproportionately represented in sports like hockey and football. Nearly a quarter of NHL players were born between October and December, reflecting that same pattern of stronger early physical development. The drawback is mostly in the early years. October babies run a higher risk of childhood asthma and more frequent respiratory illnesses in infancy because they arrive right as virus season kicks into high gear. Most of that fades with age, but it makes the first stretch of life a little rougher than average. Otherwise, October stacks up as one of the strongest profiles of the year. Solid physical build, strong mental health protection, and an athletic edge all rolled up in one. November. November babies tend to land on the more resilient end of the health spectrum. Across huge population studies, they show some of the lowest rates of schizophrenia, depression, and seasonal affective disorder of the entire year. They also tend to be easier babies fewer tantrums, calmer temperaments, and overall happier compared to those born in the darker winter months. The physical side looks just as solid. November births carry a 10 to 15% lower risk of heart disease and lung cancer, and they rank high in longevity research right alongside September and October. 
Kids born this month tend to perform well in endurance and cardio-focused activities, with youth data showing 7 to 10% higher VO2 max scores. That pattern continues into adulthood. Marathon runners are more likely to have fall birthdays, and November is strongly represented among long-distance athletes. Add in the slight maturity boost from being on the older end of the school year and early academics tilt in your favor too. Still, the early months aren't always smooth. Newborns who arrive heading into late fall spend their first weeks indoors during peak virus circulation, which means higher rates of respiratory infections and a higher chance of childhood asthma. And here's a fun fact. November babies are a little more likely to grow into night owls, something researchers think comes from being born as daylight hours start to drop. December. If you were born in December, winter sports are stacked in your favor, especially if you grew up anywhere near a hockey rink. In leagues that group kids by calendar year, a December birthday makes you one of the oldest and often the biggest on your team. Coaches favor the stronger, more coordinated kids, which means more ice time, better teams, and more dedicated attention. That advantage compounds over years, which is why a huge share of Canadian pro hockey players are born between October and December. Your health stats aren't too bad either. December births have lower rates of several major neurological conditions, including a 15% reduced risk of multiple sclerosis. And thanks to that early exposure to cold, people born this month have a better tolerance for low temperatures. Personality-wise, December babies are often described as even-tempered and generally more optimistic. And unlike November's night owl trend, you're a little more likely to be a morning person, which makes school routines and daytime structure a lot easier to handle. The rough part is how you start. December newborns arrive just as winter viruses peak, which means higher odds of early respiratory infections and a higher risk of asthma or allergies. Then there's the birthday problem. December babies get the fewest standalone celebrations, thanks to Christmas and New Year's stealing the spotlight. Even so, between the winter warrior biology and that massive hockey advantage, December holds its own just fine, even if your presents sometimes share wrapping paper. Every month comes with its own advantages, a few you probably never even knew. If you want more like this, the real explanations, not the horoscope versions, subscribe and check out another video.